situations like this, I can't tell you how many times we use chem lights to soothe, you know, children's emotions at the moment. You got to take in consideration that we just blew the doors off their hinges in the middle of the night and scared them half to death. A lot of these children, it's not the life they chose, you know, unfortunately, this is a repercussion of the choices of their father, usually, potentially the mother. But nonetheless, they suffer because of their actions. And the last thing we want to do is to place any burdens that are unnecessary on children or anybody that's undeserving of it. I remember one young man, he was 12 or 13 years old. His eyes, the darkest black I've ever seen, just pure evil. I'll never forget his face. He never took his eyes off of us. Nothing we did would pacify this young man. It's been with me for 20 years. What's going on guys? My name is Jason Pike, former U.S. Navy SEAL and combat veteran. Most of my time spent in combat was in Mosul, Iraq and the surrounding areas. Today I'm going to break down some SEAL-based movies. We're going to talk about the scenes and just see how realistic they really are. So this is referred to as a staggered formation is what it looks like to me. Overall, it looks really good. The distance in between operator is good for the lighting. Something you got to take in consideration, you can't really work around all of the Hollywood aspects, and lighting is one of them in this scene. Um, realistically, what determines if we could actually expose ourselves in a lighted condition like this, if it were to exist, and that's going to be based on how many enemies are in the area. Um, ideally, we would push up against this tree line right here and blend into the shadows. I remember doing some jungle training where it was so dark that you had to place your hand on the person in front of your shoulders and that's how you actually patrolled. There's no way you could see an enemy or an enemy could see you without some type of thermal night vision or lights. And um, as you can see here, once again, Hollywood, there's quite a bit of lighting to ensure that you can see the silhouettes of the operators. If this was real life and there was that much lighting, um, I'd definitely ensure that the uh, perimeter was spread out a little more. And something else to uh, take in consideration is, instead of being on your knees, probably go to the prone. And what determines that is exactly what the lighting is, what's the chances of you being seen, and also how long do you plan on being there. If you're only going to be there for a minute or two, there's nothing wrong with staying on your knees. That way you're not having to get up and down from the prone every you know 15 20 minutes as you're patrolling in a jungle environment when you're in a jungle environment you will have more uh, perimeters that way you can verify you're going in the right direction this is definitely something you would want to do if you're actually patrolling in an environment once you get to a perimeter or close to your target you're actually going to just sit there and you're going to be quiet for about 15 to 30 minutes and it's not necessarily that I'm listening for enemy um, noises. I'm actually listening to nature. I'm listening to the birds or the insects, bugs, whatever may be out there. And are they making more sounds after five or 10 minutes? If they're making more sounds, then you can almost guarantee there's nobody else in the area. And that's one way we can use nature to our advantage. You ready? Roger that, sir. We got about 4.7 clicks at 355. So in a true jungle environment, there should be a really dense canopy, so it's going to be hard for an electronic GPS to get a signal. So it's really wise to have a handheld compass, which this looks like a Sunto is what we carry. That way we can verify exactly what our bearings are. If our GPS works, it doesn't. If not, you're going to have to rely on the directions that you were given and the orientation that you had when you inserted into the field. I remember when we had to do some jungle training in Florida in the swamps. And man, I, t I tell you what, it was uh, not fun. It had rained for almost two weeks straight there. Then we had to go in the field for three days for survival training. And we ended up getting to a river on the map. And the river was really the only wet spot on the map. But when we got there, the river never ended. We swam for pretty much three days straight. We almost lost guys. It got to the point to where we were so exhausted day and night that we were holding on to the trees 
we would go underwater once we got our bearing, push off to hit another tree. Now the only thing that we did have going in our advantage at that time was we had some moonlight breaking through the canopy. This is a pretty slick scene right here. I like how the operator kept his composure. He whispered. They already knew who was going to be in the house more than likely. So the guy comes down out of curiosity because he hears his, hears his name being called. And he takes a couple rounds to the chest. And they go up in a security round. So you got to understand there's a difference between um, capture or kill mission and a flat out kill mission. And this entire mission was just a kill mission. This is a really good move here. One operator moves closer to the wall, which is going to allow the guy that's exposed to get out. Oftentimes, when you see shooters do um, training like this, they'll completely leave the guy out and open and just leave him. And uh, he definitely covered his buddy's back here. Now, this is a support you definitely want when you're doing jungle operations from a SWIC guy, Special Warfare Combatant Craft Crewman. It uh, looks like they're in the SOCARS, a spe Special Operations Craft Riverim. The amount of firepower these guys possess and that they, they can put down range to cover a small special forces unit is amazing. Um, there's nothing like listening to their guns just light up the jungle. Now this is real. At the end of the day, you really don't know who is who, who you can trust. I can't tell you how many guys that um, were allowed to work on our base, uh, many of them that were feeding us food. Later on, they um, got some intel. We took down their house. They had information on us, what we looked like, hair colors, the type of weapons we had. So the enemy can be anywhere. So in this case, they just get ran over. And it is what it is. Every one of these guys are true active duty SEALs. Um, I served with the majority of them. And from what I understand, they didn't want to be in this movie. It was more of a political aspect where they wanted to get the support of the American people, so they made the movie. Um, there's a couple scenes in here that just kind of ruined it for me, and this is just one of them. It's not to say you wouldn't cross a river in this manner, but it's not going to be exactly like this, not even close. So this is the actual scene that pretty much ruined the whole movie for me. This is the most unrealistic scene that I've ever seen. This is referred to as a peekaboo. Um, imagine inhaling and trying to go underwater and staying underwater and just bringing your hands out. That's not really possible for the majority of people. And there are some people who are really dense that will sink regardless, but not, not like this. Now, if we had dragers on, and if you don't know what a drager is, it's a rebreather, meaning as I breathe out the carbon dioxide and what's remaining the remaining oxygen will circulate back into what's called a scrubber. It will scrub the carbon dioxide out and then push the remaining oxygen back into a bladder. We did this quite often. As long as the water was darker, you could sit two to three feet below an enemy and see everything they, they were doing. You can make them out, color of the clothing, the weapon they had, and things of that nature. So. It is based on a reality, just not a reality w without any type of breathing um, apparatus. Now this is something that I always wanted to do in the teams, but I never got to. Every time we were gonna lock out of a sub, something happened. So locking out of a sub, there's multiple ways you can do it. You can do it with scuba equipment. You can do it with Zodiacs, or as seen here, SDVs, sealed delivery vehicles.
Getting out of a river is not easy, depending on how steep the bank is, how slick that mud type is. Not only that, even if it's not steep or slick, when we get out, we have to very slowly, slowly get out so that water doesn't drain off of us really quick and sound like rain just hitting the uh, river and can give our location away. Now, I don't know if you've ever cut chain link fence, but it's not that quiet. It's extremely loud. Chain link fence is a reinforced metal or steel. Um, so th something to consider, we don't know all the intel on the movie, but what I would say is instead of cutting the chain link fence right in front of the target where we know people are, all right, even though we have a sniper overwatch, it would be wise to push down a little bit to try to mitigate that noise and then work our way back up to the target. So this is a position you definitely don't want to be in. If you ever see a sniper hive in buildings, they have a canvas in front of them, canvas behind them so they can blend in. As you can see, as they rolled this window, you couldn't see inside. So it might be a consideration instead of rolling the window trying to see inside that you actually duck the window and bypass it. Because the last thing you want to do is be seen passing a window in a wood structure like that that can be shot through. Even if it was brick where it couldn't be shot through, it's an open window, they could stick the gun out of the window, they could throw a grenade, or they already know you're there and they're prepared for when you come in. And chances are, if they're waiting on you, somebody's going to lose their life. So I don't know if this is more of a Hollywood thing or a training scar. As you can see, this door can be seen through. It's got some broken wooden planks. So naturally, on a closed door, we always want to stack on that door. But if we were to witness something like this, it's a wise idea just to stay back off of that door five to ten feet. That way I can see through those cracks. Nobody can see me or my stomach or my chest. Whenever my teammate's ready, we nod. We move in together. He opens that door. I open that door, and then we can roll in from there. <laughs> so this is a lot of SSC that they're going to have to take with them. And SSC is called Sensitive Site Exploration. Basically where we're gathering everything that would constitute as intelligence that we could take back and learn from. I definitely like how they work this room. It wasn't on a static line basically. And the guy on the left, he gave up that workspace as the other man started pushing towards the door. Yeah, crash or distractionary device, one of those things in a closed um, structure like that, one, it's going to hurt your ears, two, um, it's definitely going to blind you as far as the smoke and potential flash if you look at it. I can't tell you how many times we would throw one in, we would enter the room and you couldn't even see through the smoke to determine if there was a tango on the other side or not. So we'd have to shift positions. Now this is a good scene. Um, if you're in a Zodiac behind all these guys, this is exactly what you would see. Just with the moonlight, it's beautiful. It's really quiet. And when you're inserting by Zodiac, there's multiple ways that this would occur. You could actually insert the guys at a certain distance from the shore, and then you would have your pilots or your drivers. They would go back out to a um, rally point and wait for extract. Or you could take the Zodiacs inland, you could pick them up, you could cover them up with any type of vegetation, or you could leave somebody with them for security during the operation. So there's a lot of ways around this. Um, although I like the Zodiacs, it's not something that I would want to do a lot. We just spent so much time on them, and, and they do nothing but chafe you. Now here's another one of these tactical yet dangerous situations obviously the lighting on the hill could be coming from you know the town um, hollywood effects so you can actually see the operators coming over the hill but as you can see as they pass through the moon uh, it literally blocks out the moon like an eclipse this is a dead giveaway that there's somebody coming if you're sitting in one of these villages and you can see this far off especially if you know that your animals are not on top of that hill or somewhere like that or nobody should be up there. It's a dead giveaway. So as you come over a crest of a hill, you might have to crouch down, even crawl over very slowly to ensure that uh, you don't eclipse that moon. 
So although this could be realistic, it's not common. And the simple reason being is because in the Muslim culture, the men did not sleep with the women in the same room. The women and the children slept in one room and all the men slept in another room. Now, obviously this operation has been going on, so everybody could have woken up and gathered together. But nonetheless, you have to isolate the women from the men, okay? Usually the women don't pose as much danger as the men, but every house we went into, usually the woman was sitting on an AK. Got a possible jackpot. <laughs> so we got a possible jackpot. Pow! All right, so it goes to show you that this entire mission was based on a kill mission and not a uh, capture mission. Now, this is something I don't like. Um, obviously, we don't have all the intel. This entire compound could be fenced off. There could be animals. It could be a cliff on the other side here to the right. But as you can see, the team is patrolling not only in the lighted area, patrolling across the access road to this little village or whatever. So, unless there's some particular reason that they have to take on that um, increased danger, there's no reason to. Could potentially come around the back here and work their, all the way around in complete darkness and never have to worry about a possibility of being seen. Blackbeard lead, what's your pod? Overwatch, you're clear to engage. Going hot. Yeah, that is not something you want to be on the receiving end of. You have saws, you have 60s, you have probably long rifles, some M4s. You're not going to survive something like that. You know, just like the Sokars, Helos inbound is definitely something that is, uh, gives you a peace of mind as far as support. The only thing I would say here is it appears that the Helos are flying really low for the Hollywood effect but also with consideration that it's a very tight village and they don't want, they want to ensure that they don't have any casualties on our side, any blue on blue. Now you would think that this is extremely Hollywood, but I can't tell you how many times we ran into people entering the door. Here's the reality. These people know their land, they know their towns, they know the sounds that are in their neighborhood in the middle of the night. And all it takes is literally a slap charge sticking to their door and um you know they come to see what's happening and this is a result we run into them this is a great transition it's realistic go to the primary we can't fight with the primary there so we just control that primary go to the secondary and ensure that we don't injure ourselves and kill some bad guys while we were operating in mosul i was fortunate enough to get to do an operation um, that we inserted by Hilo. The flight time was a couple hours. Temperature was about a negative 20. We were flying about 150 um, miles per hour and not far off the roof of the villages. So by the time we got there and we got out of the Hilo, all right, on target from my kneecaps down were completely numb to the point that I couldn't even move. Um, <laughs> I can assure you that on the way home, I did not sit in that exact same spot. So this is one of those scenes that's kind of iffy. Um, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. If they were to stop the vehicle and get out in the road, they were so outnumbered that they would more than likely die anyway. So this is more of a Hollywood scene. They go into the water to get low because they know the SWIT guys are coming in and I can tell you firsthand, the last thing you want to do is be on land standing up or on your knees when those guys uh, come in and start laying down some lead because everything is going to die. On the other hand, you know, if you get in that water, you're basically fishing a bucket, all right? You're going you're gonna to be exposed so easily and you're going to die and there's nothing you can do to get away from the enemy at that time. So luckily, Hollywood scene, sock R's and the sweet guys roll in and uh, neutralize some bad guys. Now, I will tell you, we did some operations to where we had to insert in a very similar manner because the people at the checkpoints were bought off. So every time they saw our Humvees, 
um, passing these checkpoints, they would radio to whoever they were trying to protect. By the time we got to them, they were gone. So this is very realistic. Um, ours was just a little bit different, but this was a palm sweating moment because we did some of these ops. I don't know what kind of rocket propelled grenade this was, but as far as being a dud, that's a possibility. But more than likely, outside of it being a Hollywood scene, um, all rockets have what's called a safe operating distance, meaning that rocket will not activate within a certain distance. So a good example, a 40 millimeter, 40 mic mic. With the rifling, it has to turn, if I recall, six times, six full circles before it activates, which equates to roughly 36 meters. So if we're talking realism, that's the reason why it wouldn't activate at that short distance and stop um, on the body armor. Like I said, I've actually served with majority of these guys in this movie. Um, Sonny was one of them when we were at Trade It, um, Training Detachment Group 1 out of San Diego. He was EOD, and uh, one of the reasons why they're bringing this rocket, not only just to him, just to someone who can dispose of it properly, is because just because it didn't activate, it can still be taken apart and all the explosives and the igniter um, used at a later date. There are definitely cases similar to this. We would roll up on a target. We would come up, the breacher would put a slap charge on the door, the personnel inside, the enemy. They would hear what's going on. They would get up, they would come to the door right at the same time the charge was being detonated. Sometimes they would live, sometimes they would die. They'd be missing a hand, holding an AK. Um, definitely realistic. I hope you guys enjoyed these breakdowns. These two films are my favorite and the most realistic that I've actually watched. I would give both of them around 8.5 as a whole, outside of a couple small things that were just more Hollywood than anything. If you've ever operated, these will definitely put you on the edge of your seat and make your hands sweat. So if you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, share, comment, and as always, have a great day and God bless.